We are so thankful that we have the opportunity to meet. We talked about before when uh, other countries are forbidden to worship. And with this whole pandemic thing going on and, and there are government regulations about who can meet and how often they can meet, it's a difficulty for some people to think, well, maybe we're being persecuted right now against our worship. God has given us the opportunity to meet together and we'll just have to live each day, one day at a time. We don't know when the opportunity is gonna to come to meet indoors, but right now we don't need to. And we're thankful for the opportunity God gives us here. Some, sometime soon, uh, we will be returning inside the building. I know that some of you will have uh, some apprehension about meeting inside. Maybe you've had a, a compromised immune system. Maybe you're not comfortable with being around that many people. We're, we're going to keep by the rules by keeping a social distance. And I hate that word, social distance. It's either social or distance. <laughs> physical distance. Keeping a physical distance and uh, doing our best to keep ourselves safe. So that time is coming relatively soon. We'll, we'll keep you posted as we go. If you have your sermon notes handy, would you take a look at those? And we'll get into those shortly uh, here as we work our way through our sermon notes. Let's just pray as we start this time together, shall we? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for your Holy Spirit who guides us. We're so thankful for your son who gave us life to redeem us, to bring us to yourself. Father, we're thankful for those little children that are meeting over there right now. We pray for them and the children's work as you'd accomplish your purpose in their hearts. And Lord, for us, as we look at your word, even though there are some heavy difficulties, we'll look at it, what's yet to come. I pray, Father, that you will help us to have sensitive eyes and an open heart to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 8. We're looking at verses 7 through 13 today. The title of the message is The Devastation of the First Four Trumpets. It is so devastating what will happen during this part of the tribulation. We'll only get through the first four trumpets today and the other three we'll have to look at later. Now the seven angels, this is looking at verse 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. This is a summary of last week. And we saw that the seventh seal had been opened by the lamb who was found to be worthy by God. And there was ushered in the beginning of these seven trumpet judgments. And just to kind of review quickly, there was a silent pause where they, there was a silence in heaven for about a half hour. Some people say, well, see there, there's proof right there that there was no preachers because they, keep quiet. they can't keep quiet that long. But it was really a silent pause like heaven had to catch its breath because of all the misery taking place on earth. And what's going to happen yet to come was even going to be more devastating. So there was like this calm before the storm, the next worst judgments for sin on the earth. Then there was the servants of punishment. Those seven angels were given the seven trumpets that would begin this part of the tribulation. In, in many ways, the worst is yet to come after they'd been experiencing the first six seals that had been broken. Then there, number three, there were saintly prayers that was offered. Another angel took a golden uh, censer from the altar and took the incense of the golden uh, altar and mixed with the prayers of the saints that were under the altar and lifted them before, before God. And we saw that these that this golden altar was where those martyrs were that we talked about a number of weeks ago. And they were saying, God, how long do you take vengeance on those who have those who have persecuted us? A little while number until a little while longer until your number is complete. Well, these saintly prayers not only ascended to heaven, but it says this angel took a censer full of fire from the altar and cast it down on the earth. 
And this was the, in, in part the beginning of the answer to those saints that were under the altar that had been martyred for their faith. And then number four, there was a very specific preparation. As we just heard in verse six, that the angels prepared to blow the trumpets one at a time, yet overlapping in duration. So the first one would start. And we, it was continuing its tone with the devastation that came with that one. The second one would blow its trumpet while the first trumpet's duration lasts. The second one was added to that. And we'll see two, three, and four. And then later on, five, six, and seven. All those accumulating and growing while the first six seal judgments continue. The devastation that our earth will face will be phenomenal. Nothing has ever happened in the history of our earth that could even come close to that. Now, the silent pause in heaven is done. Here we go. Remember, on earth there was no silent pause. Trauma, death, misery, bloodshed, violence, disaster, all kept accumulating with those first six seals and now we begin to look at the devastation of the first four trumpets. If you look with me at verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet. And there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And, the, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all grass was burned up. You know, these... These words read off the page almost effortlessly, but consider the horrific, horrible, global devastation. If you're putting uh, labels in your outline, this is vegetation devastation. Think about this. There was, this plant life was devastated. It would be a global upset to the ecosystem. Well, how can this be? How can this be? There, God can rain down whatever he wants. Has he ever done it before? Well, there's a passage in Exodus chapter 9 when God was working his plagues on the country of Egypt, on the nation of Egypt. And they, Moses kept saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh kept relenting on, on that and would not let them go. And there were some plagues that were given. Interesting. This is the seventh plague that was given in Exodus chapter 9, starting in verse 22. Let me read that for you. Exodus chapter 9, verses 22 through 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hail in the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant on the field in the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very heavy hail, such as had never been seen in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field, in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant in the field and broke every tree of the field. Now catch this in verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Wow. God can do it. He did it then. And he can do it again. He did it once. Even before that. Remember the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah that you read about way back in the book of Genesis. That where fire and sulfur were raining down from heaven. Well, how can he do this? Well, if you want to look at natural explanations, uh, hail and lightning. Could that ever happen? Well, some of you may have seen that happen before. Or hail and a volcano. Or with all the disruption in the world, hail and a nuclear war. God can use whatever he wants or he doesn't need to use any of that. God did it once. He can do it again. He's God. The end results are still the same. Folks, that's just the first trumpet. 
the trumpet, the devastation that that would have brought. As this first trumpet was blown, usually trumpets are blown either for a call to worship, a call to war, or a call of warning. This is a call of warning. Look out, it's coming. There was still, even in the midst of this devastation, there was still time for those to fall on their knees and repent and say, God, I am sorry for my sin. I repent, I accept Jesus as my savior. There was 144,000 witnesses that we talked about a while ago, leading many to faith in Christ. And many of those that came to faith in Christ were martyred for their faith. There would be those that know, would know that they would face the martyrdom if they accepted Christ. But there was this vegetation devastation. What a massive shock to our Earth's ecosystem. We, we hear about how you can't disturb one little moth or one little spotted owl because you got to look out for the forest and look out for the trees and our ecosystem is so delicate. Well, guess what's going to happen in trumpet number one? We're going to see a massive disruption to the global ecosystem such as never has been seen before. Number two in verses eight and nine, let me read that for you. The second angel blew his trumpet. My hunch is that the people on earth could hear somehow this trumpet blowing and a great, and, and it says, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The first one was vegetation devastation. This one is ocean devastation. Look at that, if you would there. It says in the first part of chapter eight, it doesn't say a mountain, it says something like a mountain was cast into the sea. It could be a meteor, could be an atomic bomb. It could be, God can do whatever he wants. He could click up another mountain from somewhere else and throw it into the sea. But it says something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Now notice that it says the sea, not a sea, but the sea. Uh, it couldn't be the Dead Sea uh, because the Dead Sea is dead. There's no fish to die in the Dead Sea. If you've ever been in the Dead Sea before and swam, give me a horn honk. Okay, one, all right? In the Dead Sea, the water is so saline it is 35% salt. And it, it, it makes the seawater so heavy when you touch it, you can feel it, it is almost oily. You get out there and you sit down in the water, the water can be 10 feet deep and you're only at a waist deep just floating like a cord, even me. And so it, it, the, the buoyancy there, it, it's, 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 such, it's so much because of the heavy salt content, nothing can live in there. Therefore, they call it the Dead Sea. So it's not the Dead Sea. Moses' day, they have the Red Sea. But most of the time, when the Bible refers to the sea, and it's speaking about a specific sea relative to their time frame, it would be the Mediterranean. My life doesn't rise or fall whether this is a Mediterranean Sea or not. But whatever it was, it was the Mediterranean Sea. And it, it was basically uh, right at the center of Europe and the Middle East and Africa. So it was a huge population density of those of the Bible time. And it says that this, that there's something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. This like we're talking about death here. We're talking about death. And in fact, it mentions that a third of the sea creatures died. Well, that would cause a lot of blood, but it's not just it's not just the uh, the animal blood, it's human blood. What if it happens if you're out in a boat in the middle of the sea and this thing crashes into the sea? But it says here that the marine life was all depth, a third of the fish, the sea creatures. And in this case, the Mediterranean Sea, possibly it could be larger than that, but a third of the marine life died. And there was blood. A third of the sea became blood way back in the book of Hosea, we're told in verse chapter four, 
Again, warning us about the coming time, even way back in Hosea's day. He could look forward way to this day through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Which well, sounds like what's happening in our country right now. Therefore the land mourns and all who dwell in it language and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven and even the fish of the sea are taken away. The sinfulness of the land, even back in Hosea, was projecting way forward to this time in the tribulation, and even the fish of the sea were taken away. And then that, that passage follows on in verse 9, and it says, and a third of the ships are destroyed. We can read right past that. But there are, there are merchant ships. I looked at a map show, to show today the merchant travel map of what happens in the Mediterranean, whether it's uh, 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 sea seagoing uh, cargo ships or travel ships or cruise ships. Probably cruise ships now was a little bit on the diminished side. But all of these seagoing vessels, they're just totally coat the whole Mediterranean Sea. And in fact, the United States and Russia have massive military forces in and around the, I said Red Sea, I meant to say Mediterranean Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. And when this something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, a third, a third of all of the ships, whether they're cargo ships, cruise ships, military ships, complete and utter devastation in all those who were on them. Massive massive devastation in the ocean. Folks, this is only the second trumpet. There are two more to go, at least for today. And there's three more later on. This earth is suffering. This earth is reeling. Before we even started this, there was a quarter of the earth's population already died either through martyrdom or just the judgment of the, plant, of the, of the uh, seals as they were broken. And now we're seeing more and more of the earth die. And then we get to verse 10. And the third angel blew his trumpet. Ah, oh, is there no end to the suffering and the misery? And a great star from heaven fell, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Number three, this is hydration devastation. First we had, we had uh, vegetation devastation, then we had ocean devastation, now we have hydration devastation. The drinking water was defiled. The word wormwood doesn't appear too many times in the Bible, three or four times in the Bible. And it's a word that means bitterness, deep bitterness. In Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah is speaking of the bitterness of the enemy's attack that's left him with a bitter pain. Only those of you who have served in a war zone, only those of you who have watched your comrades die, only those of you who have been in the bitterness of the battle, have any idea what that wormwood of war is like. Others of you have seen the bitterness of agony, the bitterness of death in other situations. Here, as, Jer as Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations chapter 3 is talking about it, bitter, bitter suffering, no relief in sight. In Amos chapter 5, I know the ladies are starting their Bible study on Sunday mornings here in the book of Amos. Marilyn and I did not uh, uh, confer on whether I should do this or not, but there is a passage in, in Amos chapter 5 that refers to the whole idea of, of wormwood, the bitterness of judgment. 
Amos chapter 5, starting in verse 4. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. See, there's still hope. Even in the midst of judgment, there's still hope. But do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal, or cross over to Beersheba. Or Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. What he's saying is, seek God. Don't try to seek safety without God. Don't try to run to earthly means of the remedy. Seek the Lord is what he is saying here. Verse 6. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. Only you who turn justice to wormwood. O oh, you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. What he's saying there is there are people that are so evil operating at that time. He's calling them to repentance. And you are the worm that turns justice, which should be fair, which should be right, into something that is utterly bitter and utterly devastating. And so as this, as this is, is looking, if we go back to Revelation, in this hydration devastation, the water will be bitter as this is this and it just said the star from heaven fell as no simile here there's no a metaphor that's there literally a star or some burning object from the sky will crash and it says it, it star fell uh, and it fell on the third of the rivers uh, there are some think that many of the rivers in europe middle east and south africa actually flow out of or into the mediterranean sea and this bitterness this, this toxicity will hit there and flow into all the rivers. Well, wherever is that, whether it's the Mediterranean region or globally, it's going to have an impact on a third of the rivers, on the springs of water. And the name of this star is Wormwood. Complete, utter, devastating bitterness. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people die. Now, they can die from the toxicity of that water, or if I watched you take a drink of that water and you went yuck and then you keeled over and died, you're not going to catch me drinking that water. So I, you die from the water, I die from, from thirst. So either way, people would have died, massive amounts of people, many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. That's the th first three trumpet judgments that came upon the earth way worse than what they'd been through and they thought it was worse before number four it speaks in verse 12 the fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and otherwise and likewise a third of the night so number four is illumination devastation we don't think about that too much uh, this morning i was just commenting as we were setting things up that I'm noticing a little bit early in the morning and later at night, a little twinge of fall in the air. I noticed that it's not bright sunlight at 5 or 5.30 in the morning anymore. It's not, you can't stay up till 9.30 or 10 and still have daylight. We're starting to see our days get shorter. And I like sunlight. I'm not even wearing a hat today. I'm just soaking this up. I love it. And winter time is my worst time of the year, and I love it when spring comes. Things start to bud out, and and the sun, days are getting longer, and it's nice. I'm not a happy camper by nature when it starts to get dark. And in here, in this one, in this illumination devastation, it says when this angel blew his trumpet, we don't see anything that came out of heaven to cause this. It just simply says a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened. This natural light is, is, is dim. And in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 and following, I think I'll just pick it up and read it there because... That is so important. You see, it goes back to the plagues 
that God was exercising on the nation of Israel because Pharaoh did not let his people go. Exodus chapter 10, starting in verse 21. This is the ninth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven and there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. A darkness to be felt. The darkness was so dark that you can almost feel it. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone arise from his place three days. But all the people of Israel had like where they live. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I ought to become part of Israel. But in this particular case here, I remember a time where when we were visiting Israel, you read in your Bible about King Hezekiah and how he was protecting the city of Jerusalem against attacks. So he closed up all the water sources that were around so the en enemy couldn't get a water source to, while they waited to attack Jerusalem. And so what Hezekiah did was he went to the spring of Gihon and he dug an underground tunnel from the spring of Gihon all the way to the pool of Siloam in like downtown Jerusalem. And so when, and that saved Jerusalem during that attack. When we went there as a tour group, we got to go into Hezekiah's tunnel. You carry little flashlights. They didn't want you to carry candles because it would, it would uh, uh, extinguish the oxygen in there. So they would march you through. You had water about knee deep. As you walked your way through there with your flashlight, you're knee deep in water. And the, 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 the way that they carved this thing, it was about shoulders width and sometimes about shoulder height. Anybody got claustrophobia here? You would not do well in Hezekiah's tunnel. But we get in there. And then the, the tour guide says, okay, I want you to space out to where you can feel nobody in front of you and feel nobody behind you. So we did that. And he said, okay, everybody lights out. <laughs> I never knew pitch black could be so pitch black. You could not see the hand in front of your face. You couldn't see anybody. You couldn't hear anybody. You were completely alone. Darkness can be felt. Now, here in this passage, back in Revelation, it only said that there was a third of the light. It wasn't like it got lighter later in the day or darker earlier in the day. It doesn't mean that it shortened the amount of daylight. It diminished the amount of daylight. So all day long, it was twilight. And at night, you would hope that the stars or that the moon it was a third of their brightness was diminished significantly. It was just dark and foreboding and depressing. It will be all the time. Now, it, it could be a supernatural dimming of the sun and of the moon reflection and of the stars. God can do whatever he wants. Some people think, no, wait a minute. If you look at the way the sun is bright and the moon and all this, we've got to have these things to keep an ecological balance on the planet Earth so we can all live and otherwise we're going to die without that delicate balance. God can do what he wants, but he can also use natural things, smoke or haze from these all these, this, the, these uh, things crashing down on the Earth. It's all in God's hands and he can do what he wants. We've seen the first four trumpets. But there is more to go yet. Can you imagine what Earth is feeling like emotionally? There is devastation upon devastation, backed up and overrode by devastation worldwide. If we look at verse 13, there's one more devastation that's probably worse than all the rest. Verse 13, then I looked and I heard an eagle. Now, if you have the King James Version or the New King James or other versions might read the word angel there, that's okay. Something was in heaven crying out with a loud voice and it flew directly overhead. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now that doesn't mean like you say to a, uh, a horse, whoa, Nelly. That's W-O-A-H or whatever. I don't think horses can spell. But the, the, the command to stop is one thing. 
but woe is like an announcement of more devastating misery. Oh, woe is me. And it's like the announcement of something that was ultimate. There's three more woes. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other three trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Folks, this is kind of like half time, half time in the devastation. So, number five in your notes. This is why it's the worst. Now, before I give you the title for that one, it's like, you've seen those four things happening. Oh, it's devastating. How many of us going through this pandemic, I just can't wait until we get back to, say it, normal. We kind of hope for this normal. We want to get back inside the building. We want to go back to the, to the shopping centers. We want to have potlucks. Man, I want all of that. The potluck thing sounds really good to me. We don't, I don't want to have to wear a mask all the time. So we're waiting for this normal to return. So can you imagine what they're going through? They've experienced the first six seals being broken brought incredible devastation to the earth. Now, these first four trumpets are all packed inside of the seventh seal, and this devastation is even worse than what they just experienced. And there must be saying, well, when are we going to get back to normal? Maybe now. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other. There's more trumpets? that the three angels are about to blow. Number five, anticipation, devastation. They were the people of earth who were being told, don't get your hopes up. Normal ain't gonna happen. Your anticipation of someday out there, it's gonna get better. Someday out there, we're gonna be back to normal. Someday out there, I won't be suffering like this. Baloney. Someday it's going to get worse than it is now. Enjoy what you got with the first four trumpets because it's about to get worse. All hope is lost. You think it's bad, intolerable, horrendous, unbearable. Now it's about to get a lot worse. Wait, how's that for a pick me up on a Sunday morning? <laughs> Folks, I'm not going to be here. The church, because of Christ's love, is going to rapture the church out of that. Judgment for sin has already been accomplished on the cross for the saved. And for those that are not saved, for those that thumb their nose at God, this devastation is for them. And even those that accept Christ during this time, because of the fierce anger of the Antichrist that we're going to see in future chapters, will cause them to be executed since they won't deny their Savior. They could repent. There was a warning. We have been warned. So where do we go from here? What's our take at home? What could our take at home possibly be from here? Here it is. Review. Repent and rejoice. Repent and rejoice. Is there anything that I, you, need to repent of? That's a private thing between you and God. An attitude, an action, a habit, an action some time ago, a disagreement that hasn't been made right. Something that God is pricking your heart about. Simply repent of it. And if you're not yet, having yet come to faith in Jesus, this is the perfect time to do that. Come to faith in Christ. Come to Him and acknowledge your need of His Son, our Savior. Ask Him to come into your heart. Ask Him to cleanse your soul. Ask Him to forgive your sins. And guess what He'll do? He will do it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> repent and then rejoice we don't know how good we got it can you imagine people trying to hold church 
for those that get saved during the tribulation. Government says, can't meet inside. So we'll meet in the parking lot. What's going to happen during tribulation? Boom, we're all executed. Look at us, we're standing here free and open. Rejoice in what we have. Preview. Well, we're going to come up on some of those trumpets this next week, just so that we get a preview of what's coming. Read Revelation chapter 9. That's our next chapter coming up. That's where we're going to be headed next. That's where these woes are pointing to. So, review, repent, and rejoice. And let me add one more thing to that. Repeat. Repeat your story of how you came to Christ to someone else this week. Repeat to them how you know a person can come to faith in God through Jesus Christ. Repent, rejoice, and repeat. This week is your opportunity to have an impact on somebody's eternity so they can escape what we've been hearing about this morning and what we'll hear about next week. Before the worship team comes up, I, I'd like to just give you an opportunity, either in your car or on the internet or however you're being a part of this service. Maybe you have not yet accepted Christ as your Savior. Some of you who have already done that, thinking, oh man, he's gonna go through the gospel again. Yep, I am, and I'm not ashamed of it, and I wanna let anybody have another chance. And if you're not sure of how to do that, listen carefully. It's a matter of the fact that God does love you. He loved you so much, but we're separated from God because of the sin in our life, our sinfulness, because we're born as a human being in sin and the sins that we've committed. That alienates us from God and on our own, we can't make that right. We are hopelessly lost and separated. But number three, Jesus, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins, to absorb all the judgment that was executed on the non-believers in the, in the passage we just read. But Jesus paid for every one of those sins that's ever been a part of your life. Even Satan knows that God loves us for a sinful and Jesus paid the price. And that's the fourth part here that we have to personally, we have to personally, individually, invite Jesus to be our savior and ask him to forgive our sins. And in so doing, Jesus takes that invitation and moves right in. He cleans house. He covers the sinfulness of our heart with his blood and it all turns to nothing. He removes our sinfulness from us as far as the east is from the west. He begins a reformation work to begin to cleanse us up and clean us from the inside out. That's what he does. And it just simply comes by you receiving into his heart. So let me lead in a prayer. And if that's something that you have never done before, this is your chance to repent. If you've done it before, rejoice. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your son, Jesus. And I know that there may be some here and some in the sound of my voice that haven't yet personalized this and made Jesus their own savior by accepting the great gift that you're offering. So today, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to those hearts. And dear friend, if that's you sitting where you are, you can simply, it's not the words that you say, but it's the attitude of your heart. You can simply let this prayer that I'm about to pray reflect the attitude of your heart. Kind of give you some words to say and some rails to run on here. In the silence of your heart before God in heaven, simply give him your heart. Oh God, I acknowledge I am a sinner and I'm separated from you because of my sinfulness. I recognize without your intervention, I am hopelessly lost. But I believe, God, that you sent your son, Jesus. I believe you sent him to pay the penalty for my sin. And so now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Bring your restoration at work within me. Cleanse me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for coming in. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer with me today or you prayed that sometime previous,
God answered that prayer. He came in. You don't have to hear bells ringing or angels singing or, or feel some kind of a spiritual sparkle. It's the idea that we take God at his word. He came into your heart. He cleansed you of your sin. That's your repentance. Now rejoice in that. And this week, repeat your story. And repeat that simple little plan of salvation to someone else so they might know Jesus too. Worship King, would you come up please and lead us in our final song uh, of this morning and then we'll be dismissed afterwards. Thank you for coming today. God bless you. I trust that this week as you repent, rejoice and repeat and read Revelation chapter nine that God blesses you and gives you a, a joyfulness as you speak and live your life before others.